Welcome for another journey on the Dr. James Show. I am Dr. James A. Smith, Jr. And as always, I am thrilled to be here, thrilled to uh, play a role in this, we always say, informational and transformational experience. And joining me, as always, is my co-pilot, the Shannon Peck. What's up, Shan? Good afternoon. So excited. Another week. I don't know about you, but time is flying. I don't know how we're in the middle of September, but mm. you know what? I have no complaints. The weather's beautiful. We've got a great guest today. I mean, I don't know what else to say, but welcome everyone. If this is your first time, we welcome you. We're so excited you're here. If you've joined us for multiple times, thank you for your faithful viewership with us. Um, have fun today, enjoy our guests, be participative, be part of the show, ask your questions, give your comments. We're gonna do our best to get them all in. I know we get really excited, the hour goes by fast and before you know it, we have to say goodbye to our guests, which I hate doing. Dr. James, you know that's the, the part I hate the most is landing, landing the plane. So, um, but if you are a first time viewer, um, even if you join us all the time, please, if you like the show, invite a friend next time, invite a colleague. Um, and uh, don't forget to participate in the chat room. Uh, share your comments either privately or publicly with all of us. And uh, Dr. James, I'm excited to be here. All right, thank you, Shan, thank you. We do our best to stay cutting edge. We do our best to be trendy, share things and thoughts and ideas that are happening in our world. Provide tips and tools for you to even consider and even talk about today. Wow, wow, when I say we have a phenomenal guest, Deborah Owens, President and CEO of the Corporate Alley Cat. We're looking forward to this phenomenal discussion. Let's bring her on right now. Good afternoon, Deborah. Hey, Jim. How are you? Hello, Shannon. <laughs> We're doing great. Good to see you. I'm feeling all that positive energy coming through. Good. You feeling good these days? Troubled these days? What's, what's on your head and heart these days? Um, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling a lot of gratitude that I have time to spend with my family, that they're safe, that they're healthy. Sure. So I have a lot of gratitude right now. All right. Well, speaking of gratitude, let's, let's learn a little bit about Deborah Owens. Uh, I know you went to Howard University. Thank you. <laughs> and then somehow you got into your, or started your corporate journey. Can mm -hmm. you back? Tell us, you know, where it all began and how you got to where you are right now. Sure. So that, oh, I think we have an HU alum on. <laughs> so listen, it started many years ago. Um, the bulk of my career has been in the pharmaceutical biotech space. I held many roles, sales, sales leader, leadership development, marketing training, uh, I've been in recruiting roles. Um, I led a training organization. I did diversity and inclusion, which was my side gig at one of the jobs. <laughs> so I've had a lot of experience, a lot of different experiences. I've had the opportunity to work with Fortune 100 companies. I've had great experiences in corporate. I've learned a lot and it has been a building block for the organization that I started four years ago, which is called the Corporate Alley Cat. And our tagline is because sometimes you have to get scrappy. Oh my, oh my. What, yes. What, what was the impetus? What inspired you, number one, to take the leap and jump? Mm -hmm. You are an executive in the organization. Mm -hmm. you took the leap. And what was it that moved you to the corporate alley cat. What is that about? So let me start with the impetus, why I started the corporate alley cat. So many years ago, mm -hmm. many years ago, I was at a corporation right. and I experienced discrimination. And it was, it was horrifying. It was one of those things that nobody tells you how to deal with it. They don't tell you how isolating it is. Right, right. We know it happens, but nobody knows how to address it when it happens. I did like it. Did it catch you off guard? It did. It 
completely caught me off guard because I was considered a high performer. Yeah. So I like to tell people I'd never been to the principal's office. <laughs> so yeah, it did catch me off guard and it took me about three to four months before I even called it discrimination. People were saying to me, Debbie, you know what's going on? I was like, no, it's not. No, it's not. Because if it was discrimination, I didn't know how to handle that. So what I did is what most professionals of color or black people do. I fell into my comfort zone, which is I'm just going to work harder. I'm just going to work harder and that's going to fix everything. And it didn't. So during that period, mine lasted for about eight months. I'm very honest with people. I lost 20 pounds and you know, I'm not a big person. Right. I lost 20 pounds. My hair was falling out. I was on antidepressants. I would wake up in the morning with uh, chest tightness and palpitations. Um, that was my introduction to panic attacks. It was really, really horrific. How did, and it, how did it impact your performance? It didn't impact my performance. I am a black woman. And if anybody knows anything about black women, we are masters of getting through it. We have, we were the best mask ever. Mm. So I've actually shared this story in public forums and people who were at the company were like, well, when did this happen? Because if you saw me and you said, hey, Debbie, how's it going? I would have said, great, everything's great, right? Because here's the thing, Jim, about racism and discrimination. You can say your boss sleeps around, you can say your boss does cocaine, you can say your boss beats his wife. You can say your boss is sleeping with people in the organization, but you cannot say your boss is a racist. Mm. That is explosive in corporate America. And so this situation went on for eight months. I became a shell of myself, Jim, to the point where I didn't even recognize who I was. I didn't trust anybody. Um, it was very isolating. I didn't know what to do. And then my boss did something where I thought he was trying to smear my character. He was copying people inappropriately. And for me, everybody has their tipping point. That was my tipping point. I was like, oh, no, absolutely not. And so what I did was I wrote a letter, an email that went up to the president of the company. Oh, my. And I was very clear. I said, I am being treated differently. I'm in a hostile work environment and my boss is engaging in constructive discharge. Ooh. Then I provided two or three examples with documentation to show how this was in violation with, to what we said was important in our culture. And while he was not exhibiting any of the leadership principles that we said were important to our organization. And my last sentence was, I am requesting immediate resolution of the situation. Wow. And it wasn't a long letter. And that's what I, I want people to know. Oftentimes when people document this kind of stuff, it gets very emotional and there's long letters. Folks, nobody's going to read that. Nobody cares that Jim was mean to you or Jim hurt your feelings. But they do care about if the situation gives them exposure to some some liability sure. that's what organizations care about right but debbie during this time did you have any support or you were going at this solo i had support um of course i had my family i had some close close friends that i shared this with but and this is the thing that's even most important i had mentors and advocates and sponsors at the organization. And I let them know, not early on, I let them know later what was going on. And one of the things I wanna say to people is you've got to let people know what's going on because if they don't know, they can't help you. So those things helped, but it didn't protect me from that experience. That's what people need to understand. I don't care if you're a, a high performer. I don't care who you know. Racism is insidious. 
it it doesn't care about your title it doesn't care about how hard you're working and working harder does not make it go away you have to address it head on and, and it, so, go ahead it looks like you're still addressing it head on because you said this was this was the impetus absolutely the so yeah, if I could jump ahead, I just want to share with you one really important point. And yeah. that was, I sent that letter in. A week later, the president of my company called me. And in 25 minutes, my situation was resolved. Oh. Over. Done. I stayed with the organization. I continued to take on leadership roles. And wow. here's what I learned, Jim. I had the power all along, but I gave it away. Mm. Mm. Say, that again. Like Say that again. <laughs> I had the power all along, but I gave it away. I didn't know I had the power. And I realized that I had been operating from a position of strength, excuse me, a position of power, a, a position of fear. Yes. Not from a position of strength. You know, I was just fearful. And that is not a helpful or healthy approach to take. And when I finished the conversation with the president, I said to myself, I never want anyone else to ever have to go through that alone. It was just that horrific. So that's the day the seed for the corporate alley cat was planted. It wasn't until many years later that I actually launched the corporate alley cat. So that's the impetus. One second before we go go there, you said in twenty five minutes mm -hmm. the situation was resolved. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't go to leadership or don't go to HR because they believe they're going to leadership or HR will take the side, take the company side. Mm -hmm. We're frivolous. Is you know why even do it? They're not going to listen to me, or they're going to blame the victim. They're going to blame me. Am mm -hmm. I sure? sure. What was it about your closing arguments that really got his or her ear to say, all right, this is going to be over? Well, I don't know per se what went on behind the scenes, mm -hmm. but I do know that I got right to the point. So what I told you, that was my opening sentence. It wasn't, hey, how's it going? I want to make you make you aware. It was I'm being treated differently, wow. code for discrimination. I'm in a hostile work environment and my boss is engaging in constructive discharge, all legal terms. I'm a high performer, so yeah. I don't have any performance issues, right? Mm -hmm. I have a brand, I have a strong brand, right? And this is the part that I think is really important for people. People yeah. talk about they can't be authentic. I think my ability to be who I was in the workplace, that they knew I would not go away quietly. Mm. Mm. Right? And that's because, you know, I wasn't this loud for, you know, person in the organization, but I think that I had a certain clarity and people knew that I had strong convictions about things. And so I think they knew that this was not going to go away quietly. And I think because of the documentation I shared, there's no doubt that this didn't happen. This wasn't a he said, she said. Sure. I absolutely um, had the proof there. So it happened. And I asked for what I wanted. This is the other thing. I asked for immediate resolution. I didn't say, hey, you know, I hope you guys can help me out here. I'm like, I'm requesting immediate resolution. Great and time. I think it was implied that if I don't get immediate resolution, then I will go to the next level. And what I want to say to your audience and to particular Please. Black people out there, do not be scared to escalate. Escalation is your friend. Mm. So here's what I knew, Jim. I knew that I needed to go to someone who could resolve the situation immediately. And that is not HR. HR, even if they wanted to, they cannot resolve it immediately. I needed somebody who understood that this 
person and this situation is exposing you to a level of exposure that I don't think you want. Wow. And I needed to go to the person who could do that, who could make that happen. And that person is the president, right? And too often, Jim, what I see is people continue to talk to people who aren't taking action. I'll give you an example. I have clients come to me all the time and they're like, well, I sent this letter to HR and they didn't do anything. So I'm writing them this letter. I said, well, if they didn't do anything before, right. what makes you believe that this is going to be any different. So what I'll say to people is stop talking to the wrong people. Stop talking to people who can't do anything about the situation, right? Um, what I also learned from this situation, um, I had, I consider him a mentor, but he's really a longtime friend, but he's a civil rights attorney. His name is Donald Temple. And I remember I went to Donald and I was looking all pitiful and, he was like, Debbie, listen, you're in a war and you've been shot. He mm -hmm. said, you got to hit this strong. He said, because if you hit it soft, they're going to respond soft. If you hit it strong, they're going to respond in kind. I also want to give a shout out to my father, the Honorable Daryl T. Owens. And he said to me, he said, listen, people need to know when they come after me, a piece of their ass is going down too. Those were my fighting words, right? And so what's so ironic is when I was all armored up and ready to fight, the president calls me. He says, Debbie, the first thing I want to do is apologize. We should have intervened sooner. We want to support you. I got together with my entire leadership room leadership team, if you're a person like me, that's like your worst nightmare. The whole leadership team is talking about you and it's not because they wanna give you the corner office, right? Right, right. And the other thing I, I have to stress is that I did have advocates who I confided in, yes. who were in those rooms, right? And I, and I wanna shout out another person who was a, a, a mentor advocate and sponsor for me. And I remember saying to him, I think I'm going to apply for this other position, which would have been a step down, but it would have gotten me out of the situation and it would have gotten me back to Washington, DC. And so mm. I said, you know, I want to get back to DC. So I'm going to interview for this lesser position. And he said to me, he said, Debbie, don't you do that. He said, don't you interview for that position. Don't take that position because if you take that position, you will be answering for it for the rest of your career. Mm. I listened and I withdrew my name. Now, what I didn't know is that behind the scenes, people were working on my behalf. They were trying to make things happen. So that's why I think it's so critically important that you have relationships within your organization. You have to have relationships. And the last thing I want to say to people is, especially a shout out to the Black people in your audience, save your money. Because I always had what I called my FU fund. So I could be empowered and I could do things that some might consider bold or things that really made me uncomfortable because I knew that at any moment, if I woke up and I couldn't take it anymore, I could quit and I would be absolutely fine. When you are tied with those velvet handcuffs and you need that company because you're living paycheck to paycheck, you will you will feel like you don't have any power because you need them right every day i woke up and i was like i want to quit and the only reason i didn't quit if if you can follow me jim is because i knew i could if that makes sense yeah, yeah. i knew i had the power to quit if i really wanted to but the other thing was this was bigger than me this was not just about me it was about black women and men and other professionals of color who came after me. Oftentimes I 
I hear people say, you know, well, you know, they're not going to do anything anyway. Well, of course, they're not going to do anything if you don't ask them to do anything. Right. And sometimes you got to ask them to do those things more than once. But I wanted to make sure, even if I didn't know how my situation was going to turn out, I wanted to make sure that if this person engaged in this behavior again, the organization would never, ever be able to say they didn't know because I wanted to create enough paperwork sure. that would make it easy for the next person. So listen, whenever you take these, these, these situations, there are no guarantees. Right. And that's what I'm going to say to people. I didn't know if they were going to try to fire me. I didn't, I didn't know what would happen, but I didn't care because I was coming from a place that I felt was right. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I'm going to say on this is you have to honor who you are when you are going through these processes. I believe people are bitter after these situations because they feel something was done to them right. and they did not honor who they were. If you honor who you are and you maintain that throughout, you will be fine. What a testimony. What a testimony. One of my spiritual advisors, similar to yours, said, sometimes what you're going through is not for you. It's not for you. And basically you said, saying Shannon what's going on out there no I'm just relating and and as I'm as I'm reading through the chat room and and listening to Deborah and uh, Vanessa you, you know your your fellow alum she says uh, she's definitely been discriminated against in the workplace especially with regards to pay um, mm -hmm. also um, she was asking, and for all the viewers who may not be um, within the chat room or paying attention to it, uh, Vanessa has also asked, hey guys, I have a friend who really needs to hear this. Is this, they're gonna be a recording and there will be um, on the Dr. James YouTube channel. So please um, take a look at today's as well as uh, past guests. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see here, um, Charmaine writes, you know, oftentimes we have to take a close look at corporate board composition in order to get a good idea of how staff members will be treated. Um, and you answered already on Deborah's question with one wanting to know if you had an attorney assist with you. Uh, you I didn't. Totally do it, but you had friends and you come from having that uh, vocabulary, which I think, and the proof, you had a lot of documentation, um, which again, I think is, is key. So thank you for making that point, um, you know, to us. And also it's imperative to take copious notes and documentation. So just, um, I think everybody can can relate here and uh, has been discriminated um, at least in some form or fashion. Um, I know that I have, um, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm white and Puerto Rican, and mm -hmm. I actually had a boss who was so intimidated by me for some weird reason. I, I was probably 23 years old at the time, and she sat with me in um, in an actual conference room and said, "I mean." do you think you have an attitude with me because you're Puerto Rican and from Camden? Is that what you think this is all about? Or, um, and then played on my faith too and said, aren't you praying about the situation? You say you're a woman of God. So I have been discriminated against and it's very hurtful. And unfortunately for me, they moved me to another department and she continued to stay in her high ranking position within the organization. So corporate right. definitely, um, they don't always handle it. And I was a kid. I didn't really know. I didn't have an advocate or. So. And, and, and Shannon, thank you for bringing that up because one of the reasons I started the corporate alley cat, because when this happened, I'm like, this is crazy. Black people get discriminated against women, other professionals of color every day. Why is it that nobody knows what to do? We know it's, we know that you have a pretty good chance that it's going to happen to you. I'm like, why doesn't anybody know how to handle it? Listen, my father's an attorney and he was like, well, he, but he's not an employment attorney. And here's what I found. You don't need an attorney if you address it early enough. I had at least four clients that I've worked with in the last three months. They've all had what they believe was something, a, a situation that had a hint of racism or being treated differently. One of the things we did um, is we write, I, I help people write emails and we go right to the heart of the issue. We don't get emotional. 
Mm. We state the facts. We don't try to have all the answers. We throw it back at them and say, give you an example. One of my clients out of the blue, their boss said, I'm having, you, you've shown a pattern of poor performance. And he was like, I don't even know what she's talking about because I, I got to meet expectations in December and now it's March. And then she sent him another email shortly after that saying, here are the expectations. None of them could really be quantified, but it was like 20 of them. And I said to him, and he was very stressed out about this, right? I said, listen, we're not going to even acknowledge that second email. We're not going to even acknowledge that. Someone cannot come to you and say you have a pattern of poor performance without giving you specifics and details. They need to have pointed that out to you. They need to have given you some documentation about their performance and writing. And they also need to have given you the opportunity to self-correct or to take corrective action. So I said, we're not going to even address that second email because once we start talking about those, those, um, those expectations, that's what the conversation is going to be about. And that's not what we want to talk about. So we sent a letter and here's what I encourage people to do. It was a very professional letter and it was fact-based and I don't believe in long emails. Mm -hmm. I believe that they need to be short, crisp and to the point. And so what we said was something to the effect like, thanks so much. My goal is always to make sure my performance is blah, blah, blah. Um, you indicated that I had a pattern of core performance. It would be helpful to me if you could provide me with specifics, the incidents and behaviors observed so that I can take corrective action. We also said that I'm surprised because you should never be surprised. I'm surprised because I've been at the company for over 10 years. I've never, my lowest has been meets expectations. Mm -hmm. I haven't received any documentation, verbal or otherwise around my performance. And oh, by the way, Here's an email that one of the leaders sent highlighting my, my uh, accomplishments. And then we said, you know, looking forward to partnering with you, but please provide me with this critical information so that I can address it. So do you see, you don't have to own that. We put it back on the manager. So now the manager is going to have to go back and do some work. Right. And I kid you not. Um, Two emails later, the situation was resolved. It was a miracle. The manager ended up saying that they weren't saying that this person had a pattern of poor performance. They said that they were just giving coaching. And of course, we had to document that. But let me just touch on something because we're about to do a course on documentation because I've seen some real, people have real challenges with this documentation piece. Here's what people do. Somebody's told you to document. So what you do is you have your little journal and you're documenting everything, right? If you're document, you gotta share it with somebody. You can't just keep this journal of all of the stuff that's going on. You need to send it to somebody early. And here's what happens. When you send the kind of email that we sent, you show that you're coachable, you stay with it fact-based, and you set a tone for how that manager is going to interact with you. You let them know that if you're going to come back with me with this BS, then know that I'm going to come back with you for, with something and it's going to be documented. And mm -hmm. I always tell people, write these emails in a way that if someone else, head of HR, VP, an attorney was looking at this, they would clearly understand what you're saying and they would look at it and go, well, wait a minute, why, why did you say that, right? So that's the perspective that you want to write for. So this thing about, I'm just going to say it, I think it's a little bit of a cop out. You know, well, I have documentation. If you have documentation and you're not using it, your documentation is worthless. You've got to write an email and say, hey, Jim, I wanted to follow up on the conversation we had on blah, blah, blah. I shared this, you said that. I found that, that to be offensive, blah, 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 but I'd like to better understand your perspective. You've got to nip it in the bud early. You've got to show them that this is how I operate. I don't know, and, and this is what I say, people go, well, that's how they treat other people. I don't care how they treat other people. 
I don't care what my manager does with other people. I only care about how you interact with me. Absolutely. Right? So I'm going to set the tone. And by the way, um, when my, I had that d discrimination situation, I got a crazy phone call from him. And immediately following that, I wrote down copious notes and I took four to five days and I sent him back a response. And I hit on every one of those. And in every one of those, I asked him to provide some feedback or something. And guess what? He didn't respond. He didn't respond because he was a bully. And that's what I found my experience has shown. And people say, well, he's not going to respond. Even better. Because then when you escalate, you go, look, I reached out for coaching. So I, I just want to say to people, stay in your power. Do not, I want to say, don't be scared, but I was terrified. So yeah. here's what I say to people, be scared and do it anyway. Be scared. and Now, is that? That's my model. Be scared, be scared and just and do, do it, it anyway. Do it anyway. The type of coaching you provided in the previous example, does that, is that what the corporate alley cat does or is that yeah. and more, that and more? Yeah, so the corporate alley cat does that and so much more. The corporate alley cat, after my experience, was designed to create a safe place where professionals of color can come and get strategy, resources, tools, mentorship, because as black people, we talk a lot about what's going on. Like when I was going through my situation, people were like, girl, you need to quit. You just need to quit that job. I love the, Sarah, the, the, the solidarity, but what I needed was strategy. Mm. I needed to, be, to know how to be intentional and strategic about handling this situation. So one of the services that we offer is we offer one-on-one -on -one coaching. Now it's not just for people who are having difficult times. Um, I call that crisis coaching, or if you go to my website, I call it need a lifeline. And what is the website real quick? <laughs> CorporateAlleyCat.com. All right. So the other thing we provide is we have a membership community and the membership community has a whole library of webinars that consist of professionals of color talking about how they've handled different scenarios. In that, we also have many courses. We have a negotiation summit. We have a performance review summit. Um, we have um, a course that tells you how to connect with people on LinkedIn. Because to your audience, I would ask, are you on LinkedIn? If you say yes, then my next question is, are you one of those people who after this, after you see this, you're going to send me a note that says, hey, Deborah, I'd like to add you to my network and then poof, nothing ever happens? Or are you the type of person who may reach out to Jim and say, hey, Jim, I really enjoyed that, that, that podcast you did. I'd love, you mentioned X, Y, and Z. I'd love to talk with you further about that. Do you have 15 minutes to jump on a call on September, the week of six, September 16th or the week of September 22nd, All right? So, you know, you've got to, you've got to have put the stuff into action and you have to get out of your comfort zone. Like one of the things that people always say to me, well, I didn't do it because I didn't want to rock the boat. I say rock the damn boat. But here's the most important thing. I'm really talking about your boat because many of us are sitting there in their boat, stagnant, no movement. You're not going any place and you're scared to put the oars in the water to start moving. Mm. There's a lot of things in corporate that are wrong, but there are a lot of things that you can control. And the first thing is you've got to get out of your comfort zone. If you haven't been out of your comfort zone recently, I guarantee you, I can tell you why you're having the problem you're having. Now, right? what, does that, what does that look like to get out of your comfort zone? What does that look like? What does it feel like? How will they know? Well, one of the things that um, my clients always say is, oh, God, you always make me feel so uncomfortable. This is really stretching me. You're out of your comfort zone. <laughs> nothing ever, nothing good ever happens when you're in your comfort zone. So I'll give you an example. Um, I had a client recently who got an offer. Um, they gave her 
kind of what she wanted. It was in her range, but it was in her lower range. Mm. And she says, well, I really wanted this. Then I said, ask for that. She's like, well, I mean, I know they gave me what I asked for. Well, that doesn't mean you can't ask for more. Go and ask for more. Uncomfortable feels like you jittery, you're nervous, you're a little scared, but you know it's the right thing to do. Mm. So you do it anyway. So she was like, well, maybe I'll just ask for another 5,000. I said, well, is that what you want? Well, really, I want an extra 10,000. Then why are you asking for 5,000? Ask for 10,000, right? That's what looking at going out of your comfort zone looks like. Getting out of your comfort zone looks like, give me one of my coaching clients, listen, I've been in this role. I'm, I'm no, I'm one of my clients. I'm new to this role. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do in this role. I, I just need some help. I, 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 I just am not good at navigating. Getting out of your comfort zone often is just asking for help. Why do black people feel like they have to do everything on their own? You don't unless you choose to, right? Um, getting out of your comfort zone is seeing your VP and saying, hey, VP Jim, I'd love to get 15 minutes on your calendar. I'd love to talk to you about the projects that I'm working on and hear a little bit more about your career path because I'm interested also in a leadership role in your organization. That's what getting out of your comfort zone looks like. And I can tell you the entire time I was in corporate, which close to 30 years, I've never had an executive say, no, they wouldn't meet with me. Now, Jim, there's somebody out there who's saying, well, you know what? I met with my VP and nothing happened. And I already know the story, so I'm just going to finish it up. <laughs> the reason nothing happened is because you met with them once and you didn't follow up. You were waiting for them to reach back out to you. So when people come and they say, well, I've been meeting with my, my leaders. I'm like, well, I don't want to hear about your first meeting. Tell me about your third and your fourth meeting you've had with them. They're like, well, we, well, I haven't had that. Well, again, I can tell you why you're getting the outcomes. They're not doing anything because you're not building a relationship. I say, tell me what you asked for them. Did you ask them? Did you ask them anything? Did you, did you say I'd like to be on a project? Did you say I'm interested in this position? I'm, I'm interested in going to marketing. Can you recommend somebody that would be good for me to talk to? That's what getting out of your comfort zone means. It's not the first meeting that I care about. I don't even let my clients talk about the first meeting. I'm like, let's talk about the third and the fourth right. meeting. The last example is I was at a presentation and this woman said to me, she said, well, my best, um, on my team, my manager's best friend got a raise and I just got a bonus. And so she was just, you know, beside herself about that. I asked one simple question. I said, did you ask for a raise? Wow. She said, well, not, well, not directly. I'm like, well, that sounds like a no. So again, yeah. there are lots of things in corporate that if you're a professional of color, you're a woman that are barriers, but the biggest barriers that I see are the ones we put in front of ourselves. Yeah. We need to get rid of these assumptions that we have that people aren't going to um, talk to us. They won't see value. And I'm going to give you my four rules, Jim, yeah. that I well, share with my four. Is there a title for these rules? It's just four rules. But if you, if you, if you or Shannon can come up with a name, these are just Debbie's four rules. So if you guys can come up with a name, <laughs> D4, D4, <laughs> D4. Okay, there you go. So I hope I can remember them. My first rule is don't manage other people's schedules. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I don't want to reach out to Jim because I know he's real busy. Jim has grown. If he can't meet with you, he'll let you know. Don't manage his calendar. The second one is don't say no for other people. Wow. Let them make them say no to you. I usually don't stop reaching out to somebody until they say, Debbie, please don't call me again. And nobody's ever said that or something along those lines, right? So don't say no for other people. I find that so many times people have opportunities. They're like, 
yeah, but I, you know, I, I just didn't because I know they were going to say no. Well, how'd you know that? My third rule is, let's see, we did the oh value. Mm. Do not assess what you think is going to be valuable to other people. You know, like, well, Jim, you know, he's got a PhD. I just have a BA. I mean, I don't think I have anything of value that Jim would be interested in. That's really good. Don't, don't decide. Don't, you, you don't determine what's of value to Jim. Jim determines what's of value to him. And I'm blanking on my fourth rule, but there's four. And, okay. and so when, when my clients, you know, I'm like, you're breaking rule number one. Because these are the things that prevent us from living and getting to our full potential. We're, we're making these assumptions out here. They're busy. They're not going to find this of value. I know they're going to say no. Um, and then, you know, what I would say to people too, invest in yourself. You know, you tell me where you spend your time and energy or your money and time, and I'll tell you why you're getting the results you're getting. It's as simple as that. So I'm going to be quiet. It seemed, seemed like your rules had a pattern around personal accountability. Yeah. That, that's the trend I saw. And, and Shannon popped in. There must be a question out there or comments in the chat room. Shannon? There's definitely a bunch of comments, and then I do have a question. So how would you like that, Dr. James? Why, why don't we uh, hear the, the comments? Let's, let's hear what sure. folks are out there. Sure. Eric says, you know, the F fund it for equals freedom. So staying was a choice, not an obligation. Um, yes. So happy you mentioned that, Deborah. So that's what he says. Um, let's see. We have Charmaine who says, you know, evidence is key. We have Cecily who says, that's why I keep track of everything when it comes into play, like receipts, right? Uh, let's see. We have Charmaine who says, it's important to seek help before the situation gets out of control. Um, she also says, excellent advice on how to maximize our LinkedIn connections. Mm -hmm. um, Regina, I love the solidarity, but I needed strategy. Um, let's see. Lisa says, this advice is priceless. Oh, Jim, thank you for asking. What does getting out of control zone, out of comfort zone mean or feel like? So that was really good. And um, Regina also said, women too sometimes feel like they have to do everything on their own, yeah. right? That's like our makeup. Um, and, um, I have a question here from Eric. How do you correct norms that have been established because of a lack of early communication on the issue? I wonder if that's per per professional norms, organizational norms. Or yeah, that was my question. Okay. We'll give Eric an opportunity to respond in the chat room. And then Charmaine says, you know, I'm curious to know how some of these strategies can be applied when you work in a small nonprofit organization. Great question. My question back to her is, why wouldn't they work? These, these strategies or organizational strategies, and I consider a corporation, a nonprofit, academia, uh, government, corporate, all of these things will work. So the first one is building relationships. If you're in a nonprofit, you need to have relationships, right? And let me just clarify, I'm really talking about strategic relationships, because whenever I bring up that question, people always go, well, Debbie, I know, I know a lot of people at work. I'm like, oh, oh, great. Well, why don't we reach out to this person and see if they could help you um, put together a plan or maybe they can put you on a project. Well, no, I don't know them in that way. Well, what I will say to you is that that's not a relationship. You just know a bunch of people at work. And there's a difference. So what I will say to people is you don't know enough people in your organization. I don't care how many people you think you know, you don't know enough people. So that's the first thing I will say. And that, I believe that that can work in a nonprofit. The second thing I will say is make the ask. This is the one thing I know, and I've, I've been a black woman all my life. <laughs> <laughs> nobody's going to give me an engraved invitation. No, I don't care how good I am. No one's going to say, Debbie, we've been waiting for you. Please join the table. It's not going to happen. 
So you have to ask for what you want. Now, and the, the, the other part of that is you have to know what you want, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you want? Do you just want to stay in your job and just for people to leave you alone? Do you want to be in a leadership role? Um, do you want to get X type of experience? So the first thing is know what you want. And if you don't know what you want, then get some help. Now, once you know what you want, what I will say to people on the call is, who else knows what you want? Mm. Because if you, what I find with professionals of color, we know what we want. We're just scared to say it out loud. Would you right? call that a, a derailer? Say, hmm? Would you call that a derailer? I would call that a derailer, yeah. Uh, the derailer is you don't ask, you know? And that's why people get mad because they go, well, I mean, I have more experience than Shannon. Why does Shannon get that opportunity with Dr. James and not me? It might be because Shannon spent time building relationships and then she asked Dr. James and told him this is what she wanted to do. So people don't know what you wanna do, they can't give it to you. And if you're waiting for people, I've heard people say things like, well, they should know because I've been doing, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. Nobody's a mind reader. And, you know, if you're a professional of color, nobody's trying to give you all these extra opportunities. I'm just trying to keep it real here um, unless unless you ask for those things. And That's right, Deborah. I'm just taking these notes for my marriage right now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, Shannon. You mean he doesn't know exactly? He's not reading my mind after 20 years? What are you saying? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's the same thing. You've got to ask for what you want. I find my husband won't do things that I think he should just know how to do, but if I ask him, he will do it, right? So you've yes. got to ask. And yes. the last thing I think is, is the biggest one is you don't have to do this alone. Mm. Ask for help, you know? And don't be afraid to reach out to people that you haven't talked to in years, mm. you know? I hadn't talked to Jim in years, but if something came up, we kind of on Facebook, I wouldn't hesitate to reach out to him. Now, he, he could provide assistance or he may not, but I'm gonna let him tell me no, right? And so people never believe me when I say this, but everybody you need is already in your network. Mm. Everybody you already need is already in your network. Yes. Right? So, you know, I've got Dr. Jim, James, I'm just gonna call you Jim. I've got <laughs> Jim and he has people in his network. I now know Shannon, she has people in her network. I have people I went to college with, I have friends, you have siblings, your parents know people. The problem isn't your network. That's what most people think. The problem is I don't have a network. No, that's not really your problem. Your problem is you're scared to reach in and tap into your network. You're just scared. And I get it. But after you, you go, after you do it a couple of times, you'll be fine. Start with the low risk people. The people you know love you and care for you and you'll, they'll do anything they can to support you. Start there. I'm just going to say it again. I don't believe the network is your problem. I believe you not reaching out with your network and letting them know what you really need is the problem. And real fast, I just want to circle back to Eric. Um, how do you correct nor uh, professional norms that have been established because of lack of early communication on the issue? Okay, so I'm just thinking that might be somebody with their manager kind of, is that what you're thinking, Jim? Yeah, it is. It okay, is. so I, I think that's such a great question, Eric, and I've had people and we, we've gone back to that. And I just say, go back to your manager and say, hey, listen, you know, I want to circle back with you. I know that we, you, you know, I know that there's an opportunity here for us to really maximize our communication. And I want to really tap into that. Um, so here's what I'd like to do. I'd love for us to have weekly or biweekly one-on-one -on -one meetings. You know, I would love to um, have maybe once a month or every eight weeks a conversation about development where we don't talk about the projects, but we just talk about the development. 
I'd love for us to partner because as you know, I'm interested in going to this next role. I want to partner with you and identify, you know, what are my strengths and how can I leverage them to position myself for the next role? So just, just, you know, sometimes being honest right. is, you know, you can say, Hey, I was on this Dr. James um, show. I watched it and I realized that my communication hasn't been what it should have been. And so I'd like to address that because I think we can be better partners. It can be literally as simple as that. You know, or I haven't been honest in terms of the type of support I need from you. Here's what I really need from you. Deborah, I know you specialize a lot in, in dealing with derailers. Have you mentioned the major derailers that you typically see or are there some others that are? I, I, yeah, I think the major derailers are um, not having the right relationships in place. So give you an example, in my discrimination situation, if I didn't have advocates, particular advocates who had access to the president, then I don't have anybody that's raising their hand saying, mm, that something doesn't sound right, all right? So that could have ended up with me having a very different outcome. Another derailer is when people do get in those sticky situations, nobody knows who they are. So nobody's gonna advocate for somebody they don't know. You know, oh, Jim, you mean that guy who works, is he in the county on the first floor? Oh, he, he's quiet. No, I don't really know him. You know, so that would be one. The other is not controlling your narrative. Mm, Everybody has a brand, call it brand, call it reputation, but you have one. Whether you know it or not, you have one. What is your brand? Is your brand that this person is results oriented, that this person is innovative, that this person is an out of the box thinker? Or is it, you know, yeah, Jim does a really good job, but daggone it, he is just so difficult to work with. Yes, I mean, she'll do it, but you know, you, you're going to have to stay on top of her. She can do it, but you're going to have to stay on top of her. Or, you know, some people say, well, you know, I think my brand is I'm reliable. And I say to people, I don't think that's a good brand. If you're in the workplace, that should be a given. You should be reliable. A brand is something that's unique to you. What separates you from the pack? What do you bring to the table that nobody else can bring in that same way? Doesn't mean that other people can't do it, but they can't do it the way you do. So yeah. the corporate alley cat brand is, we're gonna have conversations with you that you can't find any place else. We're gonna give you the honest feedback, even if it hurts your feelings. We're gonna take you behind the scenes. So I wanna invite everybody to one, connect with me on LinkedIn, because we do um, webinars once a month. They're free. They're if you powerful. Know that they are powerful. They are. Um, we we bring on social, desk. Media, social media goes crazy the next day. And we're honest. We, we don't sugarcoat it because Black people don't have time for sugarcoating. We need to be able to address our issues now. Um, the other thing I will say is corporate. go to corporatealleycatmembers.com. And, and if um, Shannon can put that in chat, it's corporatealleycatmembers.com. There's a whole resource. There are tons of resources in there. You don't have to figure out what the answers are. Our goal is we're trying to shorten your learning curve. Don't, don't spend 20 years learning it like I did. We're mm. trying to shorten your learning curve and accelerate your success, right? You will join a community. We have hundreds of people in that community, right? So, you know, invest in yourself. Um, the other thing I will say is a big career derailer is if you don't have any mentors. I believe mentorship is the gateway to advocates and sponsors. If you don't have any mentors in your organization, you're at a disadvantage. I know Jim may be a mentor to me, but he's not in my organization. So, he can't, I can't convert him into an advocate. Jim can't hire me. Jim can't give me any background on key people. Jim can't tell me about the relationships I need to know. 
So if you don't have a mentor, you are at a disadvantage. And people always think, you know, their mentor has to be the senior VP or the president or, you know, you can have a peer mentor. The some I found in my career the most valuable people who've been there like 20 years. They know everybody, they know stuff that happened in the past and that, that will help you understand what's going forward. Um, they could be somebody who's just a couple levels above you, but it has to be someone who has a different perspective, who has more experience, who is interested in developing people. But the last thing I say that people forget, it has to be someone who's accessible to you. Mm. If you have a mentor that you talk with once a year, eh, I, you know, that's nice, but a mentor needs to be accessible. So when you have questions, you can pick up the phone or you can get some time on their calendar when you need it, right? If they're not accessible to you, you're gonna be limited in the information that you get. And the last thing that I think is a huge career derailer is people of color don't know how to share their expertise or their accomplishments with leaders. I don't wanna brag. I, you know, I don't want them to think that I'm being overconfident. I don't wanna be a know-it-all. Well, here's what I wanna say. I don't, you know, I don't want them to think I'm meeting with them because I want something. Well, here's what I'm going to say. You may not be talking to them and that's fine, but just know they are talking to people. They are helping other people with their careers. They're just not helping you because you haven't asked. It's as simple as that. So um, I don't know. Is there anything else I can share, Jim? Real quick, since we're running out of time, I just want to know, the future of all this. I mean, we're dealing oh. with many times, uncertainty, ambiguity, fear. Yeah. What the future look like? Are, are your clients asking you that question? What's the future like? Um, I, I think the future looks like just what you described. It, it never goes, that never goes away. But what you can do is you can always be prepared. Give an example. There was an article out recently that said, you know, now they're going to be new roles. They're going to be people who are going to be in charge of remote workers, developing policies, you know, get ahead of that. You know, if you're not sure, you know, what companies are growing, Inc. Magazine always has the top 500 fastest growing companies. There's a wealth of information out there. And I think the biggest thing is, is we don't know what this is going to look like, this pandemic. So, you know, get comfortable with not knowing you're not going to always have all of the information you need to make a decision and that's okay make the best decision you can make at that time um, i also want to say if we have any people here who are part of their organization's employee resource groups we have some corporate programs um, where where we work with employee resource groups where your company can buy licenses and we do some structured programming but the first thing, the, the last thing I want to say is get, get comfortable with uncertainty. Get comfortable with technology, people. If you don't know how to use Zoom by now, that's a problem. Nobody's going to tell you that, so I'm going to tell you. It's a problem. A long because time ago, Al Melvin and Blue Notes made a song. If you don't Zoom me by now. No, let me stop. Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing. If you're not comfortable with Zoom, get a free account. You can get a free account. Practice. Technology is here to stay. You're going to be interviewing. You're going to be meet, meeting with customers. This is what I tell my people. Get a high definition camera. Don't show up looking like you're in a closet. You know, don't have some crazy looking background. You can control that. Get yourself a high definition camera and get you some good lighting. Learn how to bring your energy to the screen. It may not be comfortable to you right away, but it will get comfortable. I still get nervous every time I get a web, do a webinar. I hope it goes well. I hope we're able to give people something of value. It, it happens, right? But put yourself in a position where you're prepared. Don't get on the call with somebody and like, oh, you know, I'm not one of those young ones. I don't know how to use technology. You just told me something about you that I don't think you want me to know that you're not current, you're not ready. Don't, yep. Yep. you know, 
every day we're sending messages about ourselves. Don't send those messages like, you know, I'm not a millennial, so I'm not into technology. Okay, you've just eliminated your, th yourself from things you don't even know about. Um, one of the things I shared on the webinar we did um, last week was I brought in some of my mentees. And I, they're not really mentees, but I shared how those relationships develop. Some of my best mentors right now could be my children, literally. They're like 26 years old. I have like three of them. They're 26 years old, right? Don't be, don't be afraid to reach out to people who are younger. If you're black, don't be afraid to reach out to someone who's white and vice versa. Your network should be as diverse as the world we live in. So another pearl, another pearl. I feel like I've, I feel like I've just, you opened, you unleashed me and I just kind of went way over the, the pearl the line here, but I'm, I'm very passionate about this. I can see that. I can feel that. You were passionate back in what, 06, 07, when we met for the first time and you still bring the heat. Thank you for bringing the heat to our show today. I told folks informational transformational experience. Deborah Owens is the real deal. Go look her up on Corporate Alley Cat. The conversation doesn't have to stop. We'll see you next week on the Dr. James Show. Shannon, yes, another successful trip and Deb, Deborah, thank you again for bringing your wisdom and your cat skills to play cat. Everybody's got to unleash their inner alley cat. <laughs> alley cat, yeah. Alley cat, get scrappy. <laughs> See you next week, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Hey. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Are we good? Are we still on? I think we're still on. We're still on. We're still on for around. They're still participating.